This is Duke University. What I wanted to do was to first walk us through a little bit of Trevor's background and how he kind of came to this project. Then we'll look at the kind of history of, of Prospect um, as an event and then sort of focus in on this particular year and the way in which the sort of the interface between artistic production and the city of New Orleans kind of unfolded. So if you can tell us a little bit just about your background in terms of how you came to this work, you know, how you got interested in these areas of art and... I mean, I studied art history in college mm -hmm. and... Um, and then I also spent a lot of time in uh, African studies in college and African history, uh, mainly because I had very close Nigerian friends uh, growing up. Um, and I lived with them in Nigeria in college for a couple months over a summer and, and turned that into a research project. And then I realized I, I wanted to keep thinking about there I was re, uh, interviewing um, active artists, working artists like uh, Marina Oyelami and artists in the Ashogbo area and mm -hmm. of Nigeria and, and the Yoruba land. And um, I realized I wanted to sort of pursue that further and there was so little um, work accessible at the time. Like no one yet in the U.S. was teaching in that area. It was just a, it was really a burgeoning field. You know, people were incorporating it into larger thematics but no one was say a specialist yet in contemporary African art and that is what they're focusing on. So I had to carve out my own um, niche and I worked with uh, Nick Quarka Palm who was a traditional African art scholar and taught popular arts but he was really open to that at the University of Michigan and went there to study a PhD and um, uh, he didn't get tenure and I dropped out and I moved to New York. <laughs> cutting it. I'm, Trying to cut it short here. Uh, well, these are the interesting things. Uh, I mean, uh, ultimately, I knew I wasn't an academic. My father mm -hmm. was an academic, taught at Wake Forest University. I grew up in North Carolina. He was mm -hmm. a political scientist. And, and um, um, yeah, I just have a slightly different skill set and, uh, and interests and um, where we overlap quite a lot. But the, I had trouble, like, that, that focus, mm -hmm. you know. I'm, I'm always trying to broaden things and, and in, as you know when you're going through school it's like well, I would need you to narrow down that focus and I kept thinking more broadly and it was, uh -huh. it was sort of going against the grain in a way that wasn't helping nice. me personally. Uh, so I had one professor there who was a great artist, uh, Joseph Grigley, who um, said you, just, you should just go to New York. And I said great I'll go to New York. But I didn't know anyone in New York and I, I started, uh, I found a job in a gallery and started working in commercial galleries which was great. and. Um, to at least get the lay of the land, mm -hmm. you know, I worked first for Max Protech, and then quickly got out of there and, and worked for Sy uh, Brent Sykema before it was Sykema Jenkins in 2000, and uh, they let me curate a first show because at that time people weren't curating summer shows, mm -hmm. which is so common now and has been for quite some time. But as heads nodding, like the galleries used to just put up a sort of group show of things from the gallery and, and step out, you know, wherever they're headed to, Europe or the Hamptons or the Caribbean, and, and be gone for the month of, uh, ju months of July and August. And I got to organize a show, and it included some artists like who we've gotten to know here at Duke, like Barkley Hendricks and Wageshi Mutu and others, Rena Banerjee, who's also in Prospect. And, um, and because, no, there, because there was no competition, it got press. <laughs> so I thought I was maybe okay at it, maybe quite naively. And I had this other great idea because I lived in Nigeria that I wanted to really, I was really inspired by Fela Kuti, his politics, mm -hmm. his music, the founder of Afrobeat. And I had this dream project I was working on and that I, I naively quit my job to pursue this dream project without any... Um, without any compensation or any <laughs> job or any way to pay the rent. And, and, but it, it worked out. The show happened at the New Museum in 2003. It was called Black President. And, um, and that opened some doors for me. And, and this museum, the Nasher Museum here at Duke, opened in fall of 2005. And I was hired in spring of, of 06. So can you tell us just about the prospect itself, sort of how it emerged, the history of the of of it as, a, as an art event and, you know, how it emerged from the city. Yeah. Unlike so many other biennials and triennials, it wasn't a civic initiative that the, the you know, the, the mayor or the city council or someone said, like, we, we need to implement this in order to bring attention and revenue into our city. It actually was a group of arts professionals who t had a conversation, right, Rick, about how... Um, in New Orleans about what could be done to help resuscitate 
uh, and, and bring new life back to New Orleans post Katrina, but also how the arts would not be left out of that equation mm -hmm. and how the arts could be at the forefront. And the, the catalyst for this moment was really Dan Cameron, who used to be a curator at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York. And he had a, the idea to, well, let's create a biennial. That's what he knew. He had been curating other biennials. And he really believed and had the vision to say, if we do this, it can actually bring tourist revenue back to the city, help with the rebuilding of the city, but also um, maybe even enliven and reinvigorate the arts, the visual arts, mm -hmm. in, a, in a performance and festival-driven city. So for those of us who aren't curators, how does this work? You know, how do you, how do you imagine? It sounds like a vast undertaking um, of a city. You have multiple venues. You have a project. So what was your process? I mean, obviously, you have a network of artists you thought about. But was it also about kind of understanding New Orleans in a certain way that oh, maybe you didn't at first? Or Yeah, because I think that was the reason why Prospect, um, you know, that's why Prospect came about. That's why the biennial was created for there. So I think it has to have a close relationship to the city and the culture and its history. And, and so I, I, every artistic, artistic director has taken that sort of vision and, and connection to the city. Um, but also, just on a logistical level, it's, it's a biennial that doesn't have a home. It doesn't have, like One Venice, site. it doesn't okay. have the Arsenale or the Italian Pavilion and the Giardini. There, there is no such place. So everything is a collaborative. So the, all of the venues and partners are happen via conversations like this. Hey, mm -hmm. we'd like to do this again. I didn't realize that we'd be starting from scratch with every venue, including all the museums. Um, and it, w it, it worked out great, um, mm -hmm. but it was, it was so much more laborious than I imagined uh, mm -hmm. in that regard, because it, it's, it's wonderful to be able to, we in the end had 17 sites and venues around the city, and Pedro Lash here um, actually is one of the artists in, in Prospect, but also uh, brought in another venue. So some of these, which was great, I mean, it, uh, it was sort of a little chicken or the egg, like sometimes the artistic director or the staff uh, in Prospect recommended and saw venues. Sometimes an artist identified something and like had a proposal and wanted to do something specific. Um, but it was really all about collaboration and relationships and meeting with all the community leaders and artistic leaders around the city and you know the mayor's office on down. Mm -hmm. So I th I'm thinking about how do you think about New Orleans, you know, as a visual space? Which I mean, and we because we tend to think of it a little bit more in terms of the Sonic or the festival, right? I, those are more established ways, although it's obviously deeply. You know, it's, it's sort of visual landscape in terms of architecture is also a huge part yeah. of the city. And I, I wondered, you know, how did that pull, how did that work out for you as you were thinking about the existing city? Um, well, so what you're seeing behind me on these images are um, every talk I given to date was was before the opening of Prospect. This is the first time I've spoken about it publicly since Prospect has opened, and. Uh, so you'll see images integrated that are just snapshots around the city. Almost everything here is shot with my iPhone. And um, so, so much of it was getting inspiration, visual inspiration from walking around the city. And uh, I've only now, yesterday I was frantically trying to incorporate shots, installation shots and artworks directly into it so you could see some of the actual product and the great works that the artists made. But it is a visually stunning city. Mm -hmm. and. It's you know from the architecture to everything else, the, even the the you know um, the flora, just mm -hmm. the way that it sort of is such a tropical environment, and the way that it's integrated into the landscape, um, you know from the Mississippi River sinuously winding around the the bottom side to the Lake Pontchartrain on the top, and so I, I thought a lot about the not only the the beauty of the architecture and the space and the and the way that it's such a living breathing city but also why it is where it is and because mm -hmm. of the mississippi the proximity to the gulf of mexico and that led back to more historical connections mm -hmm. which i was able to embrace right now it's the it's the tricentennial celebration of the founding 300 year celebration of the founding of the city mm -hmm. so um I focused a little bit more on those um, on those issues and that history, and the, and consequently, a lot of the artists did as well. Mm -hmm. Did you sort of set some of the thematic agendas in some broad sense, so that the artists could have a sense of what 
what you were looking yeah, for. Yeah, in, in the in the broadest sense, right, mm -hmm. Pedro? I mean, it, it, it was, um, but it was, uh, early on it was a, um, I, I did come up with the title probably a year and a half before the show opened, mm -hmm. so that was helpful. And, you know, the Lotus in Spite of the Swamp being this sort of this loose conceptual framework, this just, just umbrella positioning for the show. Mm -hmm. And, um, a lot, a lot of people in New Orleans initially thought I was alluding to the city itself, um, but really, I wasn't really thinking about <laughs> New Orleans as being a swamp or in the swamp as much as I was that you know um, we're mired in this moment right now, mm -hmm. and and the metaphor of being able to rise above it gracefully and find you know positive outlets and positive vision for the future was sort of what I laid out. But I did send a paragraph to all the artists about thinking about the tricentennial. I really wanted the work to resonate with the city. And I, a lot of that is, was just simply in the selection of the artists. Um, so for instance, not approaching an artist who, whose work that they had made in the last five to 25 years, if you just had taken something out of their studio, wouldn't feel right mm -hmm. in New Orleans. So not asking someone to really step out of their comfort right. zone. But artists who've been engaging issues and, and aesthetically been making work that feels like it might immediately fit in and have been engaging, engaging those types of topics. So someone like um, Rena Banerjee is a great example uh, who'd never shown or, or, or thought about New Orleans and her work, but her sense of materiality, the way that she brings so many materials together and creates something new from different parts of the world, it resonates so much with the carnival culture. Mm -hmm. And and everyone there has just loved her work. So just trying to bring in those artists that would kind of visually make sense, but also um, uh, thematically and conceptually. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, like the city of course has all these boundaries, right? And ways that people move or can't move and policed in certain ways, all the, uh, you know, the kind of racial or organization, the still the legacies of, the, of Katrina. Um, yeah. And there's all these layers, obviously, that's a lot of complicated stuff. But uh, since a lot of, there is a lot of artwork that's sort of out in space in different kinds of ways, I wondered if that was something, did you consciously think about, you know, working against certain boundaries or trying to, to go across them in certain ways with the artwork? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's the way that Prospect One began when it was this landscape that had been dramatically changed by Katrina, by the mm -hmm. hurricane, by the devastation of the city. And so it was just infinite possibilities of what Dan could do with the artists, with you know artists like Mark Bradford and Wageshi Mutu and others, and, and going into the Lower Ninth Ward and areas where, bless you, where most people, um, tourists, didn't spend a lot of time. And that was part of the magic of Prospect One and engaging those, those um, geographical areas, but those communities also and working with people in the communities. Um, over two and three and towards four, the city itself has rebuilt and changed so much. Mm -hmm. uh, the landscape, I talked to some artists who are like, I, I just want to find a Creole cottage and I'm going to re redo the whole inside, I'm going to paint it. And, and I was like, we're not going to find a Creole cottage that's <laughs> right. accessible for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's one right now for the next three weeks, but that person who owns it is either renovating it or selling mm -hmm. it. The, 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 the city is changing so much. So the, some of those, um, those political geographies are, are so rapidly being redefined mm -hmm. in the city um, that what I ultimately decided to do was to rein in the parameters and actually make it more um, confined to a central area. Mm -hmm. But but where things got a little more uh, geographically oriented was think more about the river itself. Oh, okay. Because all, with some of this change, there's been greater access to the river. Uh, uh, for instance, Crescent Park was created, and so we were able to engage it. We went, um, had a work on the Algiers Ferry, and we installed works by Mark Dion and now Kara Walker over in Algiers Point on the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Things that, like that that hadn't been done before. Um, which we're able to break some new ground. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, we had, like, the last iteration didn't have any work in the French Quarter, and we were able to have a handful. Mm -hmm. um, so it, re it really varies. It's a little bit up to the artistic director, but it, it um, you know, there definitely were artists who had a very clear vision for what they wanted, but it, it was impossible to execute it for logistical reasons or just finding that space. It was so, that is the greatest challenge um, with site-specific work. 
Because what is, again, I've just said, but what is a, what's available like in the conversation if I'm meeting with uh, the person who owns the land today, their commitment to it being available a year and a half later or even six months later, and then having it on view Mm -hmm. Not to be rented or anything else done for four months is a is a huge mm -hmm. ask, and mm -hmm. um, so that. But we but we did try to um, get into a, a number of communities, but make make also make a footprint that is navigable, so that because so many people also come into town, and you know the the likelihood of seeing everything in two days is pretty slim. But if you have three days and change, mm -hmm. hopefully you can at least. You know, right. see the way, yeah. get a get a pretty good sense of it. Mm -hmm. I want to see if we can talk about some of the like the lotuses that came out of it, and some some of the things that were surprising. Um, and maybe first, if there's since you had set this agenda if, or thinking about the historical right, the 300 years and these these historical layers of Africa, Caribbean, and, and links. Um, you know, if there are particular works that, in some interesting or surprising way, really spoke to that um, that emerged. Yeah, there are there are a lot. Um, where what what examples? Um, How many pieces, by the way, are there in the? Or so if you, I don't even I don't even like know. The there, so there are okay. seventy three artists, okay. and then it varies tremendously because like one artist, um, like Kara Walker, or Hank Willis Thomas, produce one work, one sculptural work. Others, if they are a photographer, or a painter, mm -hmm. they may have five to twenty five okay. works. Um, for Barclay Hendrix, you know, we have 12 of his major portrait paintings, which is this probably the second largest grouping mm -hmm. of his work since Birth of the Cool. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think what, you know, in thinking about an artist like um, Odile Donald Odita created this wonderful project, we were actually thinking about the Algiers Ferry and how to, mm -hmm. you know, almost every artist that we brought in for site, a lot of artists are brought in for site-specific looks, whether they're creating site-specific work or not, because at least to spend time in the city and allow them to experience it on a level, meet with people who can be helpful in the production of their work, not just physically producing, but in the thinking about their work and scholars mm -hmm. and so on, but also just to inspire them, simply. Mm -hmm. And um, when Odili, uh, a, a painter and artist based in Philadelphia, um, from Enugu, Nigeria. When he came in, we were talking about doing something on the Algiers Ferry, like turning it mm -hmm. into a work itself. And uh, and it was a great idea, but it just, it, it, the, the deeper we got into it, we knew it wasn't really going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was hard for a dilly. It, it was hard, it was them, the transit authority actually being able to offer these yeah, you know, so it, it it wasn't it just wasn't really going to happen. And um, but ultimately, he came up. It allowed him to rethink his whole process, and he came up with this brilliant idea of this project, which is um, about sort of African American resistance and celebration in the city. And um, mm -hmm. and so he created. Now I'm going to forget how many, but let's say roughly 15 or more. Um, Different flags that are sort of an homage to that to that history in the city, and and they're placed at very specific sites of of um, um, black cultural sites around the city, and um, one of them happened to be on the Algiers ferry. So taking because Algiers Point was the was the location where when slave vessels and slave ships came into the city, that's where they, um, you know brought all the, all the people out into essentially um, holding facilities until they could feel that they would bring them back across the river mm -hmm. uh, for sale. Mm -hmm. And so th we, t we talked a lot about that history of the number of the artists and then Kara Walker made something in, very much in response to that history and that site as well. Um, but Odili's really stands out because it's less, um, it's spread out all, all around the city and people um, discover it and bump into it. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, you got a major sites like Congo Square, and um, but it's also it, um, bringing attention to places like the Eagle Saloon that people forget were, you know, is being um, uh, it's being restored now and preserved. It was a site where Buddy Bolden and other had performed. So 
I'm curious a little bit about other other moments besides this one, maybe where the space, especially around the river, are there other things, whether you want to talk about Kara Walkers or other pieces that were that kind of relationship to the river? Well, I might as well yeah. talk about Kara Walker because she's the one work that, uh, hers is the one work that hasn't been yet revealed and it's going to be uh, unveiled mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks. So I, I might as well cut to the chase and, and <laughs> talk about her. And that will be, is that going to be permanently there? Or? No. Oh, okay. No, it is a work that was um, completely inspired by our trip to Algiers and, and, um, mm. and the history of New Orleans, but it, it will only be there temporarily. It, it's an incredibly complex work. So when we when we went to Algiers and we were walking around, there is a very, it's, there's an image of it here when you get to Cara, but there's a very small plaque speaking to the history I was just alluding to of, um, of the, the slave history on that specific site in Algiers Point. And, um, you know, Cara spent a lot of time with me looking at it and, and, of course, was processing this as we were walking around. Like, that is the only marker of that history, this very modest plaque in the ground. And so she was thinking about what she might do to um, bring a little more attention to that history there. Meanwhile, um, the, the Natchez steamboat, the sort of tourist steamboat, is going up and down the river, and you hear um, uh, Dixieland music playing, and sometimes Dixie itself. And um, so Kara's thinking, well, without saying anything, this is like a month later, she sent me this really in involved proposal. Um, but she was thinking about, well, gosh, you know, music is such a, um, uh, it's such a, a bear of our emotional history in so many ways. And she's thinking, well, gosh, can I respond to that? Now, she doesn't make sound-based work, but that was her first response was, was um, oral, you know, thinking how, how can I respond sonically mm -hmm. to that? And um, so she thought, well, that's a, I'm hearing this calliope, and the calliope is the steam sort of organ on the, you know, on the steamboat. And so she, her response was, well, I wonder if someone can make a calliope, if I can make a calliope, my own Kara Walker calliope which I would have never thought of even attempting. So she found a guy in, in, in rural Michigan mm -hmm. who makes calliopes. And um, she contacted him, and she went way down the rabbit hole before even telling me what she was doing, which was <laughs> exciting and nerve-wracking. And, um, and, and so she decided to do this, and then, she, and then um, she went out and tested it, and she's like, oh yeah, I can really do this, and I can create a soundtrack of like, um, songs of protest and black empowerment and, and sort of think that through and then she thought well gosh I better work with someone who really knows this history and will validate it so she started working with the jazz pianist Jason Moran mm -hmm. and they created the soundtrack together um, and then of course you know almost like you know for her it's such an what she does every day but it's like what is the visual component how do you actually see this thing what, mm -hmm. what does it look like and with her interest in uh, Americana and, and antebellum history, so she started thinking about um, a giant covered wagon that would, um, that would house this thing, and almost like a, you might see it a circus, you know, um, some ways going like one. She, so everything was sourced and made in the U.S., like made in the USA, but it was from these very specific uh, producers around the country. So I think it's someone in the Dakotas, she found like someone who makes like old time, old timey vintage wagon wheels out of wood and, and had the whole thing produced. And, and it's her trademark signature silhouette imagery that, mm -hmm. that covers um, the outside, but it's been cut, sort of laser cut into metal. And um, so that's what we'll see. And then it will, over the weekend, it will play three times a day. So it'll kind of be a rebuttal or a response to the Natchez Steamboat. Huh. And, um, and then twice, Jason Moran is gonna come and perform it live over the weekend. Oh, wow. But what I was just talking to, to Rick Powell, our, our colleague here, and, and saying we, we were pretty naive uh, to think that we could have produce this thing in time, not only in time, but actually execute it for the opening because none of us knew what it meant to produce and run a calliope. I mean, it, it, as Kara pointed out, she's like, Trevor, it runs on fire. So um, it, it's fire and, 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 which, and water. So we have to have a water source and constant electricity and steam, and we're trying to do it 
on the Batcher, uh, on the edge of the Mississippi River. So there, those things aren't even accessible. So, but you know, the, the, the great thing about Prospect is that it, it allows the artist to dream beyond mm -hmm. what they normally do and to sort of push the boundaries and try and come up with it. Now, there are always pitfalls and shortcomings because like we dreamt way beyond what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Karis created something that I think inevitably will, uh, 50 years from now, people are reading about her, they're gonna have to talk about this work because it's so outside of what she's ever produced before. And it, and it definitely will have a life, to answer your earlier question, <laughs> after Prospect. So it was inspired by New Orleans, New Orleans and, and by Algiers, but um, you know, it, it probably will be in her next large thematic you mm -hmm. know, solo show. Um, and it'll live on wherever you know someone may buy it and have mm -hmm. it in their private collection in their private museum or, or what, hopefully it's public and we can mm -hmm. experience it. But mm -hmm. it'll have a life. Right. Well, well, I'll just ask one more question then open it up for discussions. But I'm just curious whether um, you yourself as in your work as a curator, this experience sort of shifted how you how you see and practice or this was you know a different kind of work that you'd done. So does that change how you think well, of your I, work? Uh, it's so different than working in a museum. Mm -hmm. It's just so antithetical to what we do every day. And you can organize a, a, a large thematic group show at a museum, and it can have 60, 70 artists and feel unwieldy, and you can commission a couple of works, but it's nothing like doing a biennial or a triennial because you know your team, mm -hmm. you know your building, yeah. you know your budget, it's all transparent. Um, and here, everything's shifting all the time. The ground is shifting beneath you mm -hmm. constantly. And everything is, is a, as Pedro can attest to, is a moving target until the last second. Um, venues change, venues evaporate, you know, like in the 11th hour. Um, works change, works that we you know, works that were been on the checklist for two years, um, turn up on Instagram in another show in a different part of the world. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a crazy, uh, wild, process um, mm -hmm. so th the great things are are the sense of community mm -hmm. that you can build and I think that's one of the best parts about being a curator is bringing people together and that you really experience that in this type of in this type of project which is incredibly rewarding and I would say even more so at the opening have the artists come in from all over the world and, and seeing them connect and the mm -hmm. way that they connected and feeling a I mean, Pedro can attest to this, like a, a sense of camaraderie even people who hadn't met before was, was wonderful, in part because you have an opening that's not two hours, it's four days, so that helps a lot, and you're, you're in the city of New Orleans, which is a really special place. But I think also that there's, they're part of something maybe that's bigger than any of us as an individual or, or bigger than an organization, and, and I think people feel that to mm -hmm. some degree, which, mm -hmm. is, which is great. Right. It's interesting, right, that there's these ex there are these expanding biennials or projects like this. The the one in Haiti the last couple yeah. you know times and um, and it does seem like it's an interesting question whether this form does it need to change in different cities or right. It's a kind of form born out of a certain place, but it seems like in each city it takes on a different. Uh, but I don't know if you have an idea about that. I mean, what, will there be other ones like this in other cities or? There's so many biennials and triennials now. I think when the art world, you sort of roll your eyes when you hear there's another one because who can go to all these and and who are they really for? Right. Well, I guess and I, and I think yeah. that's, at least we know how Prospect was founded, the idea of who it was for. Mm -hmm. It was really meant to be for New Orleans as opposed right. to for the art world. Now, you have to have the art world support it in order for it to be successful. Mm -hmm. And, um, but also I think that, you know, uh, Biennials need to uh, find a way to have a very specific identity to set themselves apart. Mm -hmm. and, and I think New Orleans is such an incredibly unique place that, um, that has a soul that other places don't have. That it, um, you know, one person I spoke to who's an art critic in, in New Orleans said, I, I think this is fantastic, but I would really love to also see just all the work at the Venice Biennale here in um, in New Orleans. I said, but yeah, but you're someone who gets to go to the Venice Biennale, mm -hmm. you know. So that I think for the average person, um, from my experience, it really needs to resonate in order for it to, right. see, and it needs right. to be set apart. Or otherwise, why would people travel? Most of the artists in Prospect had never been to New Orleans before. Wow. 
which was surprising to me because I was selecting them because I thought their work made sense there. Mm-hmm. I was like, your work, and they said, oh my God, I've been thinking about New Orleans for 20 years, but I've never shown mm-hmm. there. I've never mm-hmm. had an opportunity. Mm-hmm. So that was actually a big surprise for me. Right. Um, and that's probably one of the, I mean, there will be all these effects probably on their artistic practice, I would imagine, from this, in terms of the effects broadly. I think it has that opportunity when artists, those who were really able to stretch themselves or those who um, have been doing what they do for a long time and they push themselves a little bit more and they're in a a new stage Mm -hmm. or under a new spotlight and getting getting new attention, newfound attention, uh, certainly it has the opportunity to to help people grow a little bit, myself included. Right. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.